All right, to start our afternoon here, I'd like to introduce also um, our panelists, uh, beginning with Robert Green. And Robert is most well known, I think, for his work, amazing work that he did on patient acknowledgements around um, Alzheimer's testing. I think he really demonstrated the fact that consumers want to know and can handle significant clinical data. And he's now going to be talking, to, I'm hoping, more about his current work on whole genome sequencing and patient interaction. Also on our panel is Heidi Rehm, who's uh, in, uh, the uh, laboratory director at Partners Healthcare Center at Harvard, and um, also a co-author on the, I guess, somewhat controversial ACMG guidelines. Um, and leading our discussion today will be Daniel MacArthur. Um, uh, and Daniel is, I just realized it's McAllister. MacArthur. MacArthur. Okay, I did get it right. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, and Daniel is a, a clinical geneticist and assistant professor here at Harvard at Mass General and um, working, uh, you know, on translational genetics. So it should be a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we are very fortunate uh, here today to have two thought leaders uh, uh, here, uh, living here in the Boston area, working in the, the general space of clinical genomics. And the way we thought we'd structure this session today is we'll start by uh, Robert and Heidi will first give brief introductions to themselves and to their own work. Um, we'll, we'll, kick things, we'll kick off the discussion with a few questions from me, but I want to spend as much of the session as possible with questions from the audience. So we'll try to leave as much time as possible for you guys to step up to the mics up the back and chime in with questions. And so uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll turn the mic st uh, straight over to Robert. And I think we're going to aim for about sort of five minutes or so just introducing the sorts of work that he does. Great. Thanks very much. So excited to be here. I, I have to say, I've never given a TED talk, but if I look in a mirror and squint my eyes a little bit, do, you, know, you see what I'm saying here? It really feels like it, especially if I could walk around, but, which I might. But anyway, I'm going to try to give you five minutes on, the, on sort of how I got here. And um, it starts with a question, as it often does when you're a clinician, it starts with a question from a family member Doc, can I have my own APOE results? And I was a neurologist taking care of families with Alzheimer's disease, and a patient, asked, a patient family member asked that question. And I went to a geneticist, and the geneticist said, no, under no circumstances could you ever do that, and looked at me like I was you know, literally insane. And out of that grew uh, 12 years of funding from the NHGRI on a project called the REVEAL study, Risk Evaluation and Education for Alzheimer's Disease, where we have not only demonstrated that APOE as a paradigm for risk can be communicated safely. But we've tried to tease apart the aspects of genetic communication in many, what I think are many interesting ways. And so that's what got me into this. And then I, I got so excited about it that I retrained in medical genetics with, among others, Heidi as, as one of my teachers, and um, just became more and more excited by this field. Recent grants that we've gotten actually are looking at the downstream health impact and behavioral impact of consumer genetic testing, uh, where we get some of our uh, survey recipients from 23andMe and some from uh, Pathway Genomics. And the ones that we got from Pathway Genomics were recruited from patients like me. So I'm finding out that this whole community is, 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 is incredibly connected. And, and by the way, one of the questions this morning was, what is the outcome? of individuals who are in PGP. And I, and I really want to say, uh, and I've talked to Jason and, and George briefly about this, I want to say that the surveys that we're using for these direct-to-consumer tests could be easily adopted for, um, for use in tracking future medical and behavioral outcomes of PGP uh, individuals if that's something PGP wanted to pursue. Um, what I'm doing right now and what this has grown into is, is sort of a reveal on steroids, or as I like to say, moving from one gene to all of them. And, and what we were able to do, again, with, with Heidi's uh, partnership, was develop a project we call the MedSeq project, in which we are sequencing whole genomes on patients who either have a genetic disease or who are basically healthy. And in both of these cases, we're randomizing people to get the results of their whole genome sequence or not, and then we're going to follow them downstream 
to see what this means in terms of healthcare costs, psychological impact, behavioral issues, surveillance, iatrogenic problems, and all of the things really which are at the heart of the burning questions around this issue. Um, I will say that this has been a remarkable challenge. It's dovetailed with some of what Heidi may tell you about, which is how do you develop, uh, and which many of you are actually working on, how do you develop a clinical interpretation pathway that is robust, that is scalable, and that yet takes into account all the eccentricities and um, errors that are, are present in databases. Heidi's been a remarkable leader in that whole arena, and we're depending on her and MedSeq for that. But together, we've created, if you can believe it, a one-page summary of the whole genome sequence for that we think either a specialist physician or a primary care physician will be able to utilize. Now, that's actually what we're going to test. We don't know if it'll work. We could just confuse the heck out of them, and it could turn out to be a really messy waste of 10 million of your tax dollars. But um, <laughs> the question at large is, can we scale up genomic testing in the practice of medicine so that it is just like almost any other test? Primary care docs don't have to understand um, radiation to get an x-ray report. You don't have to understand chemistry to get a blood report. Can this be something that's truly integrated into the everyday practice of medicine. Finally, I'll spend my last 30 seconds of my five minutes telling you where we hope to go. And that is, uh, we've, we've generated some recommendations uh, about um, incidental findings of whole genome sequencing in clinical medicine, where you're doing sequencing for a particular indication. But really, so many of you are interested in what happens if you do the genome of an ostensibly healthy person. What can that tell you? And nowhere is that more exciting in terms of the blueprint of a future life than in the newborn. And so uh, keep your fingers crossed for us because we have a grant under review right now uh, with NIH to be the first grant, I think, that will use whole genome sequencing in a brand new newborn children, both uh, healthy ones and uh, sick ones. So I'll stop there and just tell you that that's sort of what I'm working on often with very large teams of people, teams such as those that are led by Heidi, and I'm just very excited to be here and be part of this world. Terrific. Excellent. Thank you very much, Robert. And uh, Heidi? Uh, so I started in this field in basic science, a PhD in genetics, but about 10 years ago, um, took a path to develop a new clinical lab, which is called the Laboratory for Molecular Medicine at the Partners Healthcare Center for Personalized Genetic Medicine. Um, and really, in that laboratory environment have spent a lot of time uh, bringing new discoveries into clinical testing and molecular diagnostics, um, as well as bringing new technologies into clinical use through the genetic sequencing um, that we do. Uh, and the technology we primarily focus on in the lab has been sequencing, starting 10 years ago with Sanger sequencing, moving into array-based sequencing about five or seven years ago, and, that, and now we do all of our large-scale tests by next-gen sequencing, and we're about to launch uh, a clinical whole genome sequencing service. Um, and so we've really been focusing for 10 years on clinical sequencing as a, a tool to support clinical medicine. However, over that time, it's become very clear to me that there are many, many major roadblocks uh, in this field that have inhibited the introduction of clinical sequencing into mainstream healthcare. Um, and they span everything from the technology, and it's not push a button and get out the answer. There's a lot of technical challenges in that space. Um, the other major bottleneck is the interpretation of sequence variants. Uh, and, you know, we have had to amass tons of people to interpret variants. We have like a farm of fellows. Anybody who walks within a five foot radius of my lab gets sucked into the variant assessment vortex. Um, and it's a huge effort. And we, uh, we often arrive at no answer. Uh, and then the third is really how can we take the results, even if we understand them, and, and integrate them into the healthcare environment in a way that physicians can actually make use of. And so in those three areas, more recently, I've started different endeavors to focus on, especially the last two, 
uh, one being infrastructure to support integration of, of uh, genomic medicine into healthcare, and that's through software that we've developed called Gene Insight, where we're trying to support both the laboratory geneticists and more effectively interpreting results and creating simplified reports, as Robert was alluding to, that can be used by a physician, as well as creating tools for the physician to be able to best interact with that data, be able to get updates electronically of, of their reports as knowledge changes over time and really focusing on supporting the, the clinical side of this space. And then the last side is really in how we fundamentally understand genomic variation, which unfortunately for most of the variants, for those of you who've had your genome sequence, you have four to five million variants in your genome, but if you've looked at, looked at your report, there's very few of those we actually understand. So how do we go about really understanding the bulk of the genetic variation that we all harbor and likely has an impact on our health and, and disease? Um, and so through that, you know, recently we just found out we've been uh, funded for a large genomic resource grant that will create an environment, and we're working closely with NCBI at NIH to create the ClinVar database, where we will work with many laboratories, primarily clinical, but also research groups, to bring their data into the public domain for open sharing, um, and also create tools to enable curation of that data for better understanding of it so that we can all use it in the clinical arena, uh, as well as support research endeavors to better understand that information. So that's, that's a major focus that I'm now sort of spending a lot of my time on is this notion of public sharing and getting data out of the proprietary databases where this data has been sitting for many years. Um, the largest volume of sequence variant data actually sits in clinical laboratories. Um, and unfortunately, it's not necessarily always the case that those labs are not willing to share, but there's not been an effective place to put that data uh, and to sort, you know, so, uh, support them in getting it out of their databases and into a common environment where, where it's in a standard format that we can all effectively share. So we're really creating the standards and the infrastructure to support that, getting the data in, and then enabling curation of that data for better understanding of it. So th those are the you know, big areas. And then you know, more recently working with Robert to really support um, integration of genomic sequencing into healthcare and understanding how we can do that in the most effective ways. And I'll, I'll stop, stop there. Great. So we're certainly living in exciting times right now in that we're actually seeing, I guess, really for the first time since the human genome sequence was published, genomics, you know, true large-scale genomics being used in a clinical setting. And I guess my first question really was to Heidi. Um, you're now rolling this out in, a, in an explicitly clinical diagnostic fashion. Is the biggest, are the biggest challenges for you right now dealing with the technology, so dealing with the errors, the sort of errors that still rise up with these high-throughput genomic methods, mm -hmm. or is it still very much focused on the, on the interpretation? Where, where does your lab spend the most, the most of its effort? Yeah. Um, you know, I think both the technology and the interpretation currently are challenges. Um, you know, on the technology side, I think the community is struggling with, um, you know, should we stop doing targeted sequencing, disease-specific tests, and just move everything to genomics and exomes? Um, and the answer is no, not yet, because the technology to effectively sequence a genome or an exome is not complete. Uh, and there's, you know, we like to call it not whole genome with a W, but H-O-L-E, genome sequencing, because there's major gaps, whether you do an exome or a genome, that fall out. Um, when we run targeted sequencing, Half the cost of the test is in the next-gen sequencing. The other half is all the Sanger and other things that we do to fill in all the holes. Um, and so we do that for targeted sequencing. It's not done when you run a genome or an exome. So you know, for tests that have high sensitivity with a targeted test, it's actually a better test today. So we as a community need to, do, to fill in all those holes and actually be able to deliver complete sequencing to patients before it's going to be effectively interpreted. Um, and then there was... One other thing you asked. Well, we also we interpretation, but I think that. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. And clearly, this ends up sucking up the, the lion's share, I guess, of the effort. And that is a, a major challenge is yeah. interpreting the genomes. And, you mm -hmm. know, um, for healthy individuals, you can look at 4 million variants and not find anything that you can readily say will impact their health today. Of course. There's an, an, yet we know there's stuff in there. And so mm -hmm. how, what's missing? What, what do we not understand? And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's probably the biggest challenge. And, and I know I've seen numbers from you in the past about the, the 
the amount of time it can actually take to review any one variant in a clinical setting. Yes. And that's, yeah, there's a lot of manual curation that needs to get done. I mean, how, how do we scale this up to a whole genome, whole genome setting? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, one of the ways that we're doing that is through, um, through bringing data together so that um, if we bring everybody's data, then we've all looked at different variants. Um, and if we can put them all into a single database and run a genome through everybody's data, mm. we'll be able to pick out more variants that at least someone has said mean something. Now, you still have to go in at that point and, and review it. But right now, we have such a small number of variants that anybody has said anything about it that are in the public domain that that's all we're looking at. And we're essentially ignoring mm -hmm. the other 4.8 you know, yeah. million variants in a patient. So we need to get everybody's data so we can pull out what to prioritize and what to focus on, and that will mm -hmm. help with our assessment. Excellent. Now, Robert, I'm, I'm going to pick on something that you'd said, which was, I mean, uh, discussing this very exciting potential project looking at sequencing newborns. Now, obviously, there's a big difference. I think a, lo a lot of us work in a space where we sequence people, who, kids who are already sick. So we already know there's a, there is a disease mutation somewhere in that genome. It's just a question of narrowing down and finding it. But it's fundamentally a very different conceptual thing to go in and say, here is a person where we don't know if, this, if they will be sick or not. Is there anything that we can learn from their genome? So how, how, should, we be, how should we be thinking about that? It's a really good question, and it's a troubling question, because uh, your typical healthy adult or child, as Heidi said, will, have, uh, will not typically have a high penetrant Mendelian known pathogenic mutation. Those are fairly rare. So what do they have? Well, they have a lot of common complex variants that are probabilistic in terms of heart disease or diabetes or something else. They have some reproductive variants. And the question is, if you disclose these to an adult or to a family about a child, does that help that family? Uh, does it help the parents of a newborn who you find out is carrying a cystic fibrosis uh, recessive variant to know that one of the parents is carrying a cystic fibrosis variant so that they think about that before they have their next child? Does it help to find out that they have a variant that's more likely to have a deafness if they're exposed to a particular antibiotic, because six months from now, they might be exposed to that antibiotic, and they could avoid that choice. We actually, th those make intuitive sense. Oh, and, and as far as the common complex variants, you know, we know that cholesterol, if we pay attention to cholesterol as a population, we do better in terms of stroke and heart disease. So if we, if we knew that people as a population were more or less at risk for diabetes or heart disease or obesity or whatever, could we tweak their diet and their exercise in population-based ways where we could never predict that it's really going to help you, little Johnny, but if we apply it to a population, we could see that it helped the population at large. So these are nuanced questions of personal utility that go beyond a little bit whether my sequence will help me as an individual. And so I think it's almost a public health approach to this. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's the, que the very open questions. The other side of the coin, the dark side of the coin, of course, is that it could cost a lot of money in, a t in an era chasing down these things, an era where we can't afford to waste money on health care. It could scare the bejesus out of family members who are unsophisticated. It could produce in the child a sense of a sick child or, or people who are so-called, quote, patients in waiting. I mean, these are, these are things which our, uh, our friend who, who wrote the, um, who wrote the uh, amateur book um, uh, to some degree made fun of. And, and, and believe me, I've been on the receiving end of, uh, of the uh, uh, ethicists' uh, criticism in many situations. But they, they are legitimate. When you sit in front of a patient or a family and you have to look them in the eye and they are tearful or anxious, uh, th these, are, these are real issues. <laughs> and I suspect, I mean, the, these are issues that probably resonate with a fair chunk of the people in this room, given many of you either, you know, have already had your genome sequenced or will shortly. And, and I will actually, I'll open the floor up to questions after one more question to both of these guys. So if anyone, if anyone does have burning questions at this stage, if they'd like to file up to the mics, uh, we can take those in a, in a couple of minutes. But I did want to touch on uh, the relatively controversial report that both of you were involved in the production of from the American College of Medical Genetics, re released relatively recently. And I said this was a report on the way in which secondary findings should be returned to individuals who've had their, their genome sequenced. For those of you who are not familiar with the term, sec secondary or, or perhaps incidental findings are 
findings that are found not as a result, they're not related to the reason why that person's had their genome sequenced. So this might be a kid with muscular dystrophy and you might instead find in their genome a, a variant that predisposes towards breast cancer, for instance. So the, I guess the issue about the report that was somewhat controversial was the idea that uh, patients may actually not have much choice in whether or not they get those results returned. So there is a set of, at least a set of variants where uh, you felt it was, it was compelling that those variants did actually get returned um, almost regardless of the, of the patient's wishes. And I mean, obviously, I think the people in this room are, are probably pro in general, the return of incidental findings, but they may be a little bit more cautious about the idea of not necessarily having a choice in doing so. So I was wondering if both of you perhaps could speak to, from, from your different perspectives, why those recommendations turned out the way they did. I'll start off and pitch it to you. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, if you get your chest x-ray done to look at your ribs, uh, the radiologist has a fiduciary duty to not just examine your ribs with their eyes, but to examine your lung fields and your heart and to write on the report that they find an abnormality. If you go for a rash to the dermatologist, he or she, and there's a melanoma next to the rash, they uh, don't sit you down and ask your permission uh, say, I may discover other things on your skin. Would you like to know them? They, they look at your skin, and they report back any incidental findings they have. Genetics, we have a different standard. We have a different standard which says, uh, I'm going to ask you each and every time I do a predictive test uh, in genetics. But that's a function of the history of genetics, and particularly the fact that Huntington disease was the earliest predictive test, and it's exceedingly traumatic. Um, so we uh, took 14 months and as a working group of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics to try to come up with a set of recommendations for what's going to happen when medical genetics scales up. Now, this isn't research. This isn't recreational genetics. This is clinical genetics when we order a genome for a particular reason and the interpretive pipeline is triggered it becomes relatively easy to recognize other disease genes. So what should the ordering clinician be told? Remember, the report goes back to the ordering clinician, not to the patient. You want to take it from there? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, from, from my perspective, we've watched a number of groups tackle the task of talking to a patient about genome sequencing and trying to deal with this question of what do you want back? Um, what secondary findings. And some groups have taken the tact, all right, let's divide up all secondary findings into four buckets. There's pediatric onset with a treatment, pediatric onset without a treatment, adult onset with a treatment, adult onset without a treatment. They spend hours and hours with the patient trying to describe all these different scenarios, asking which ones you want back and saying, well, we'll we're gonna, whether you like it or not, we'll give you pediatric with a treatment, but that you have the choice of these three. And you know, the, the answer was 16 hours of counseling to try and figure out what these are. And I would argue that there are very few diseases that I could easily put in one of those four buckets. Most every disease I deal with, some cases are adult and some cases are pediatric. What's the definition of treatment? Does that include something you would manage or is it truly a drug treatment? You know, like, is there a treatment? And so I think it's really difficult for, from a practical standpoint, to approach every patient, educate them fully about the spectrum of genetics, and expect them in a short counseling session to come up with what it is they want back at one point in time. And then you gotta go back and maybe they change their mind, maybe they learn more. And it's just, it's really a nightmare um, to think that we can staff in a practical way. It's worse on the lab end, because you get all these requests coming in and every case has gotta be a different kind of report. And what if you saw something you weren't supposed to give back and now you have this information? And so, you know, from my perspective, it's a practical one. I think that our, our experts are the best at trying to make, and we spent a year deliberating over the diseases that would go on this list and trying to make incredibly thoughtful decisions about what should go on based on our understanding of the diseases, the benefit to patients. We don't have a year to educate every patient about every one of those diseases to try and get an informed decision back. And so we made the recommendation, and it is a recommendation, that there was a set of diseases, and there's not a huge list, it's a short list, of things that we all had consensus on being good things to give back because there were things you could do about them. Could you give a couple of examples? Of yeah, so one is a disease that we test all the time. It's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, most common cause of sudden cardiac death under age 35. Uh, and I have 
you know, spent traumatic hours with families who have lost someone unexpectedly that would have given anything to know that in advance, to have taken the appropriate step, steps, an intracardiac device that could have been implanted and prevented that sudden death. So these are diseases that do kill and for which there are ways to intervene. So, you know, I think that's where I'm coming from. It's both a practical perspective and this is not, you know, the adult onset neurological diseases with no treatment on the list. These are things that I think the average individual would want back. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is our perspective. Um, it and is as you say, they are just recommendations, not... Yes. Yeah. And what's been amazing is that, I mean, I hope that sounds reasonable to you. It sounds reasonable to us. Um, please, please let us know if it's not reasonable, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Sure. But, but there, is a, there is a group of at least 20 nationally recognized experts who are preparing a scathing uh, criticism that we have circumvented autonomy and that we are going to close off the future of children and, and all sorts of things. Um, so there are two sides to this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, do we have any questions from the audience at this stage? I think there was someone who's standing up on the mic there. Great. Yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering, has there been any information studied about the usefulness of like veterinary model that you know you still have, you've got your dog, you love your dog, you still have the emotional investment in the attachment, but it's not a human. Has that been utilized at all? In, in, what, in what setting? Um, just in terms of the effect of um, knowing your genome on the outcome of uh, your life, you know, in terms of if you find you have a disease later in life, if you become depressed or whatever. Mm -hmm. Something um, you were talking about earlier um, on that side. So, so you're asking about the benefits of having an animal, a companion animal in the context? Well, is it like as a sort of as a model, for, because you're talking, I'm sorry, I don't remember people's names, but um, the person over there. Robert. Yeah, Robert. Yes. <laughs> uh, we're talking about, you know, having sequences of, you know, the newborns and, you know, in the future, will these newborns, if they have got their whole genome, if their family has seen it, I think you were saying this, you know, what, how it will benefit or be deleterious to their um, life. And I was just thinking that, you know, a dog is kind of similar to a kid. <laughs> dog person. <laughs> well, there's, there's really no evidence. You know, the more people look for evidence that genetic information causes psychological trauma, mm. the less they find it. Even in Huntington disease, which is sort of the most devastating piece of information you can get, if you, no one's ever done a randomized clinical trial. If you follow those people, sure, a lot of them get depressed. Uh, some of them commit suicide. But it's because they are in the early stages of a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, that, and it's really hard to untangle what piece the information and I, might have. Because these are often people who've also seen family members suffer and die from that disease. Right. And that's potentially quite a different story from someone who learns may learn at an early stage that they may carry a recessive disease that they've never seen before, so they have no particular. I think it's important to remember that genetic information is one piece of a clinical picture. You wouldn't take a CAT scan, even a whole body scan, and say, I'm gonna use this to tell the future of your medical life. You would integrate it with a history and a physical and the perceptions and emotional context of that human being in front of you. And I think that's where we're going to go with genetics. I think the genome and at some point the, R the RNA expressome and mm -hmm. all sorts of mm -hmm. downstream technologies should be integrated with conventional medicine to make the best choices for an individual patient. Now, you can, you can say, and I wouldn't disagree with you, that doctors are not ready, but they'll be ready when this starts arriving on their doorstep. They will have to get ready. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Did we have another question on that side of the room? That... So you touched on it earlier that doing predictive genomic analysis requires a lot of data. So I'd like to pick your brains a little bit and know your thoughts on how to tap into private industries like electronic health record companies and other healthcare providers. Um, sure, so um, there's a few pieces in there. Um, one, I think it is quite clear that genetic information doesn't do you a whole lot of good without the phenotypic information alongside it. Um, and this, you know, we're no longer in the era of, of rare diseases and focusing everything on rare diseases. Common diseases are critical. And in fact, 
now there's much more of a continuum because all of a sudden we sequence healthy individuals and discover they have the same variants that we thought only caused you know, severe rare diseases. Um, and there's both mild versions of those diseases, non-penetrance, variable expressivity, all the concepts in genetics that lead to a highly complex world. And so I think it's become clear that really the only way we're gonna figure out and understand the vast majority of genomic variation is in fact to have incredibly rich resources with both genetic and phenotypic information. And those need to not be point in time phenotypic information, but longitudinal information. Because um, using de-identified samples in a biorepository with a point in time set of data attached really doesn't get you that far. We discover variants, and we'll, what do we want to do? We want to go back to the patient and say, we found this variant. It says it predicts X, but do you actually have that? And let's do a test and investigate further. Um, and I think, so I think the model that we all need to move towards is one with open consent and participation to integrate clinical care with research on a continuum basis. Every patient is a research subject. Every research subject is being cared for in the context of clinical care. Um, and ideally, to in fact integrate electronic health records directly into supporting the process of understanding genomic variation in a very real-time integrated way. That, <laughs> so let's all participate. <laughs> Speaking to the converted here in this room though. Um, and that's gonna take time, it's gonna take infrastructure to support that. So it's just thinking it's a good idea, it doesn't mean it's gonna happen. But I do think um, some of the movement towards more consistent, accountable care environments in the, in the EHR world, um, as well as a more openness and willingness in the community to share data for the benefit of all of us, I think is gonna help us get there. But we're gonna have to work together. And sort of, it raises, I think, an issue that's near and dear to many of the audience, which is, is the idea that the patient plays a role in, in that ongoing interpretation process. Absolutely. But how, how do we actually do this without, without sacrificing privacy? And I know the, it's always been hard to get these things through yeah. IRBs and, and ethics review panels because of that, yep. that challenge. Well, one, one point is that I think if you actually ask individuals in a healthcare system, do they want to participate, most of them want some privacy assurance and then they say yes. So the willingness is there. That's really important. People are by nature fairly altruistic. I think that they do want feedback. They do want control. I think systems we're, we're starting to hear about, such as the one Sharon Terry is going to talk about this later this afternoon or tomorrow, is, is critical to consider. They are revolutionary, though, in terms of what we work with. We work with HIPAA rules that are very constricting, and the HIPAA rules do actually apply in most institutions to all IRB-approved research uh, or in, with patients. So we're, we're dealing with whatever the local IRB imposes plus what HIPAA imposes, and you're very often handcuffed a little bit by that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I would add, you know, I think, I think we need to engage the patient community um, who really want, you know, these things to happen, want us to share data, um, and they are going to be the force that allows us to do it. Because those of us can all sit here and say, well, we got to protect the patient and not let, you know, but at the end of the day, if that's not the patient wants, is this overprotection and the patient actually wants us to put it out there, us to do this research, then let's listen to them. Um, and I, you know, I got my genome back from the Personal Genome Project, and I can remember, you know, scanning through the variants, um, and then the button of, are you willing to publish your data to the, to the internet? And I was about to hit that button and I thought, do I really want to do this? <laughs> and I went back and I scanned through all the variants and I gave it a little bit of thought and I said, you know what, yeah, I do. <laughs> and I hit the button and so my data's somewhere out there, right, with all of yours. Um, but I, you know, I think I had to go through that thought process and say, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen here? You know, what's in my genome? How predictive is it really? You know, I'm a, 40 some odd year old person with whatever health issues I have, you know, and it's, it's out there, you know, in my day to day life, my genome's not that different from that. And I, you know, you, you have to go through that thought process, but at the end of the day, I, I want my genome to contribute to the educational process that I hope everyone else has done. Mm -hmm. I think that's why, I mean, one of the reasons PGP has been so valuable is just starting to change the dialogue in that respect, Absolutely. moving, moving sure. the conversation forward. Yeah. Did we have another question on that side of the room? Was that right? Oh. Aaron, Del, Aaron Del Duca, DNA Genotech. I really appreciate your insights on how you're defining a clinical grade or a diagnostic worthy uh, genome sequence. I'm envisioning a not too distant future where 
um, someone shows up with their own sequence. Right now you guys generate your own, you have your own QC metrics, but can you help us understand what that threshold looks like? <laughs> So that's a great question, um, and there is a lot of dialogue in the clinical sequencing community about the development of standards. We actually, um, through the ACMG, are just about to publish our next-gen sequencing guidelines. Um, that said, it's not like we're setting an absolute threshold and saying everything has to hit this mark. At the end of the day, largely in the community, you, the standard is, if you develop a new test, it's gotta be at least as good as what's out there and ideally better. And so to some extent, you allow market pressure to enable the iteration on quality. However, what we do put into standards is you have to validate and you have to be very clear on what your test does. And I think that's the standard that we're focused on, is you, you need to be accurate in what you're claiming your DNA sequence test or whatever it is the test is, what it can do and what it can't do and being very open in your report about its limitations. And so I, I think that's, you know, at some level we have to allow the community to compete and to improve and not set a threshold that's too low or too high, but in, in essence, be sure that everybody is very open with the limitations of what's out there right now, which are significant. We had a question on this side of the room now. Great. So uh, certainly I want to congratulate both Robert and Heidi. You've done great work thinking rigorously through the issues of reporting the, these kind of complex results back to patients, whether controversial or otherwise. Um, I, want, I want to take the ideas that you guys have both published on and just ask, how does this play out once you get outside of the, um, uh, the perhaps rarefied or progressive environment of the major academic health system? Like, you know, if we wanna get genetic testing broadly used in the 85 or 90% of American healthcare that's delivered in the community health system, what, what in addition to the things you've been talking about do you think has to happen? I mean, in my mind, it's, it's, it's about simplicity of reports. Can we be very, you know, I've seen many reports that are like 17 pages long and physicians bring them to me and I can't even figure out what the laboratory is trying to say. You know, and, and I'm a laboratory geneticist. So I think we really as a community need to focus on how we can convey this information in simple terms. And that doesn't mean trying to educate the entire physician force on all the nuances of variant interpretation. I think we need to distill it down into simplified ways. And Robert mentioned our whole genome sequencing report being one page for the entire thing in terms of a summary. Now that's very high level, but the goal of that was to give the physician enough information to say, can I handle this or do I need to refer? Um, now we have subsequent pages, and the reports are typically more like four to five pages, where pages two, three, and four go into more depth about the variants that are actually contributing to the disease that's listed on the front page, and what the evidence is, and what that disease actually is if you've never heard it. So you know, it's, it's coming up with, with uh, interesting ways to try and give you levels of, of complexity, and not giving it all on the, you know, in the whole report, but giving a simplified view so that a physician can make a first line judgment. Oh, okay, like not, you know, a lot of reports don't even say the word negative, you know? It's like there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Well, did you find something or not? It's not clear to me. So I think that's, you know, key thing. And then the other is development of clinical decision support tools directly in the EHR for consuming this information, like pharmacogenetics. You know, we implemented our first decision support rule so that if you have a particular variant, and it's contraindicated to order a drug, if the physician goes to order the drug and the variant is sitting in there, they actually get a pop-up screen that says, this patient has a variant that suggests you shouldn't order this drug, and they have to actually enter a reason that they're disagreeing with that. So that physician doesn't have to know anything. They didn't know that the test was ever done, or that there is a test for that drug, or what the patient's result was. It's delivered to them in real time when they need it for their decision. That's the kind of tools we need to build to make this mainstream. And just one sentence to add on to that. I mean, doctors are pattern recognition machines. They're not geneticists. So we're trying to create a sufficiently valid and appropriate interpretive pipeline, as, is, as are many of you, and report 
that allows them to do their job at a pattern recognition level. I think it's, and it's also interesting. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of concern about the, the, need, the urgent need for physician education. And obviously, there is some need for that. But as I think as you've both pointed out, actually what we need to do is make it so that people can interpret these things without the need for great, right. for great I mean, education. Will a trained psychiatrist always be a better than a primary care at diagnosing and treating someone with mental mm -hmm. illness? Probably. So we don't really expect primary care docs to become geneticists. But can a primary care doc today diagnose and treat anxiety, depression, in some cases bipolar disease? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. we, we have evolved and we will evolve. Great. Uh, was there a question on this side? Yeah. yeah, Esther Dyson, PGP number three. Mm -hmm. This is the same question, but from a, a very different place. Twelve, 12 years ago, I would have said, how can we put genetics into high school education? Now, I would ask, is, is there anybody here working on a curriculum, a game, some kind of teaching tool for the general population that would teach them not so much genetics and this variant, but basic statistics, how to, how to think slightly more mathematically. If you have that question, you know, you have 15 times the chance of getting ALS or whatever it was, my first question would be, well, what is the normal chance, 15 times what? How do you, is anyone looking at that? Isn't that what we really need to do? We're gonna do it one way or another as people get more and more results, but if we can have educated people getting the results, that might help. We, I believe there is a response down here in the, in the second row, a very Great. enthusiastic hand waving. Good. 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 Great, and any journalists, Robert Krulwich, who can help get this out into the market. Thank you. Excellent, thanks, Esther. Okay, I think we have time for one final question from the, from the floor. Uh, is, was there someone over this side? Okay, great, someone over that side, sorry. Uh, Mike Doherty, American Society of Human Genetics. Uh, my question changed a little bit in response, uh, Robert, to your uh, last answer. Let's assume that, that you're able to develop a, a good one-page report and that um, as genomics and medicine evolves, primary care physicians are gonna be much better at providing care for things that may have been outside of their, um, their purview, um, perhaps uh, currently. Still, last year, only half of the medical genetics residencies got filled in the country, and we have only a small handful, thousands, of genetic counselors. Uh, one can imagine even in, the, even in the case where PCPs pick up a lot of this responsibility, there's going to be a lot more recognition of a need for referrals. What do you see as the future for, for who provides that, especially in a system where uh, we don't have very good reimbursement for the cognitive medical sciences, and so we're not attracting people into those professions? Well, I'd be interested in what you guys think as well, but I'll just, my brief answer is I think, I think it's a huge problem and I don't see an obvious answer. I think that um, to some degree, uh, decision support, integration with medical records, and incremental things will be perhaps the path. And what do I mean by incremental? I mean that when we decided to try to create a list, a minimum list of secondary findings, we really kept it minimal. We said, 57 genes, 24 conditions. Um, and you know, we think that with a very bit of brief orientation, most physicians could learn to handle that. And I think we'll, we'll then sort of see a module for recessive traits and a module for pharmacogenomic traits. I don't think, it's not like the genome's gonna be dumped on a clinician all at once. So I guess my only, I, I think it's a great question. I don't have a good answer. But the best answer I have is that little by little, with the most life-saving things first, this will get integrated into everyday medicine. And, and if I can just add, you know, I think we're ch in a changing paradigm where there needs to be some degree of appreciation for genetics in every specialty. Um, and there's a chunk 
of genetics that can be handled at the specialty level. You know, for cardiomyopathy testing, a lot of our tests come from cardiologists now because that's a heart-specific genetic disorder that those specialists feel that they can handle. Uh, and there's more genetic counselors being hired in those specialty, cl you know, clinics as opposed to only working for a medical geneticist. So I think that's one area where domain-specific genetics should be handled in a domain-specific way, uh, whereas the more complex, you know, dysmorphology and multi, you know, system issues are going to be the ones handled by genetics. I think the other issue is how our health organization, you know, environment pays for services, reimbursing procedures and not the time people spend, which is largely what happens in genetics is time spent and that's not well reimbursed. So our healthcare system needs to change for outcomes, not just, you know, procedures and, and I could go on from there. Perfect. <laughs> Limit it. Um, and unfortunately, in the interest of time, I think we should start to wrap up now. So I just wanted to thank all of you guys for your questions and also to thank uh, both Robert and Heidi for a fascinating discussion. Thanks. Thank you.